Good afternoon and welcome to a special edition of Hot Issues. Now, the background says it all. We are at the Palace of Ochehini, Osaji Fuamwetio for Repining. Now, we are here to discuss issues of national development. We are here to find out the role of chieftaincy in the nation's development and also how we can win the fight against Galamse. Now, he's one person who has been leading this fight. He's one person who is very much concerned about the country's environment, how we ensure we protect our environment. That is the reason why we are here this afternoon to speak to the Ochehini. My name is Winston Awen. Thank you so much for joining us now. Come with me as we go speak to the Ochehini. All right, so welcome back from that short break and thanks for staying with us. This is Hot Issues and this afternoon we are at the Ochehine's Palace. As I told you earlier on, we had to have a discussion with him concerning issues of national development. We want to find out first the contribution of chiefs towards the country's development and also find out how well we're winning the fight against illegal mining that you might want to call Galamse. He'll be sharing his thoughts on all of these issues right here on Hot Issues with me, Winston Awam. So we've been joined by Osaje Fuamwetio for a painting. Good afternoon and thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. I, uh, delighted that you guys are here. Um, I'm all ready to have that discussion with you. I'm, I'm grateful that you came with your numbers to do this. And we're grateful that you also accepted to have us. But it's been 60 years of independence. What's your assessment of the country's development over the last 60 years? Before we get into that, uh, Winston, this afternoon as I was coming, it's a special weekend. A weekend when uh, our Lord Jesus Christ faced brutal punishment for whatever reason. And as I was listening, uh, the pastor said that the most brutal punishment ever meted out to human beings is what he went through. And he went through that for our sake. And he said, we cannot do anything except to praise him for living that life for us. So, Tomorrow is the Sunday. I just want your crew and I and our hearts to praise the Lord for bringing us thus far. But the main question, um, 60 years. Yeah. I remember I was a seven-year-old when we attained independence. Okay. I heard our first prime minister, then president, said to all the nation that Ghana is free forever. I also heard him say that the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it's tied with other African nations. And then he went further toward the world, let me warn you that the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. 60 years ago, there was excitement and euphoria in the country. Everybody was excited. And he meant well. 60 years down the road, we have not lived up to our potential. Because what it meant that in 15 years we'll be an industrial nation. Mind you, at the time, Winston, that we were at par with South Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, in fact, the then government said that by the turn of the century, Ghana, together with this country, would be a first nation. We are not. What are the reasons? We have not loved this nation anymore. We, we don't do things that make the nation look good. And Krumah did his part. But since then, we have had an orgy of coup d'etats and instability, and all of that. Until 1992, we came together and said to ourselves that enough is enough. We're going to have democratic elections. And once you have that, we have had that for seven times uninterrupted. And everywhere I have read, when there's political stability, it comes along with economic growth. We've had the political stability but we lack the economic growth. Why do we lack the economic growth? We 
we, we start off as 4.5 million people. And Nkrumah came on and said that the chiefs were not equipped enough to run the nations. In fact, the favorite speech that he gave, he said, uh, chiefs will run and leave their sandals behind. It was quite a fight, but the chiefs also understood that here we come with new boys from overseas who claim to have new ideas to manage the affairs of our country. They gave in, and since then, this is what we got. It's because Nkrumah wanted centrality of governance. At that time, I think it was right. 4.5 million people. Let everybody bring their resources together so he can distribute all across the nation. We have gold, we have cocoa, we have diamonds. Very rich nation. And then, again, he didn't finish his tenure. Oh, he was preaching togetherness and there were problems internally. And Krumah was a great African, but in the country that we live in, people feared him. He had a fear-based leadership, he was saying. But not only that, we were still moving on and Ghana was a great place to be. Then we had all just a coup d'etat all around. So instability set in. Programs that were cut short. What Nkrumah did, and I give him credit, was he made sure that education became the critical, institu uh, critical institution that would lead us to our industrialization. So he set up schools that all of us attended. And it was good for the nation, and it was good for everybody. Coup d'etat, number one. Not to continue what Nkrumah did, and everybody else was bringing in their, 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 their programs. And so uh, we were all over the place. And Ghana uh, became very uncomfortable, and we were not seen as the country that Nkrumah wanted us to be. So the coup d'etat and the periods of instability retrogressed us as a nation? Yes. Yes, that's what happened. Now, you talked about, you know, at the time, we were about 4.5 million, so it was okay to have a centralized system. You're now about 27 million. Is it still okay to have a centralized system? That's amazing. That's a good question. The 4.5 million people and the system we had cannot hold 27 million people. And so leaders who have come after Nkrumah should have had the audacity of change to change the system. We're still centralized. And that's where we are, where we are. Because we cannot manage our economy properly. You cannot stay in Accra, Western, and manage schools in Tamale. It's just not feasible. But that's what we do. And except everything that we want to do in this country is in Accra. And when people cannot be given a chance to shape their future and take charge of their, uh, their destiny, you have these problems that we have in our country. So what sort of uh, decentralized system would you advocate? Well, we can start off by having schools left in the hands of uh, the people who live in their communities, one. Two, healthcare. Three, community water service. If we do that and have people control their own sanitation, you not have the sanitation problem we have in Ghana right now. Because in this part that you're sitting right now, everybody knows every house. And so if there's a sanitation in town, everybody will know that they're looking at you. If you don't take, they will just have to report you and you'll be punished. So that's one. And because centralization does not give us a chance to investigate and thoroughly have accountability, our money's not spent properly. Mind you, our country is described as a constitutional republic with power vested, sovereignty vested in the people whose representatives sit in parliament. That description says to me that the country is just between the people and parliament. It never mentioned the executive. It never mentioned the judiciary. So parliament should protect the purse. We have a system here, centralized, where the executive is too powerful, Winston, that we need to spread it where people can begin to develop their own communities. Talking about the spread, yes, we need to spread it. In what ways? The ways I've told you. If, for instance, 
I have advocated for that. Move 10 ministries into 10 regions. The central government is the biggest employer. If you take the Ministry of Forestry, for instance, what is that ministry doing in Accra? The Ministry of Local Government. So if you give each region a ministry, you are developing the place, you are bringing up real estate, you are improving hospitalization, you are making teachers go to work there, you are developing towns and commerce. So people will not troop to Accra every morning. That's what they do in America. You know, in Washington, the Secretary of Agriculture may have his office in Washington, but the core workers are all over the place. You cannot keep the Forestry Commission in Accra and live in a glass house and have people cut trees here in Chibia. Nobody's here to see it. That's number one. Number two, there are a whole lot of young people entrepreneurs who want to get into the business of trying to develop our country. They should be given space and chance in these areas to come to. If we have developed infrastructure and education, people will come. And it decentralized will help all of us. And what should be the role of the chieftains institution in all of this? Well, Winston, we, first of all, uh, the Constitution says that the institution of chieftaincy, together with this traditional council, is hereby established by customer law and usage, and it is guaranteed. So we're not going anywhere. There were 48,000 settlements in Ghana. Government has only 12,000 appearance in 12,000 of them. The 36,000 that's left is left in the hands of chiefs. So if this country is at peace, it is because of the dead rules and the policies. Now, none of the past build their own schools. A Boakwa State College here was built by an Ophriata. The hospital here was started by him. The bridge was started by him. Workers who went to work here were also trained as masons by him. And everything was fine. So we are willing to support and complement central government if we be allowed. Chiefs have been stripped of their resources. And funny when you hear people talk, Winston, that one of the biggest problems we have in Ghana is chief tenancy. I wonder why. I wonder why. We don't sign checks. We don't contract anybody. We don't negotiate policy. We don't make the laws. We don't collect taxes. And so if Ghana is going down, why would anybody even waste his time saying that, well, it is because of chiefs? I don't understand. There are some who suggest that the disputes, the chief tenancy disputes, have sometimes led to underdevelopment in some of these areas. Well, Azo, uh, Azoka boys and Invincible boys have, have fights. What has that done to our country? Students go on strike and challenge authorities. The trade unions have strikes all over the place. What has that done to our country? There will be disputes. We need to make sure we minimize those disputes. But no one, if, if you, for instance, where I said, not you, the Achim people wanted this. So if anybody wants to cut down Chief Tansi, they should first go to the Abushua Penny, where they come from, and ask the Abushua Penny, why has he been elected as Abushua Penny? So all the Abushua Penny got together to elect Odikro. So if you can do that, you, you can do that in your little corner. But the people of Achim want this. The people of Asante want the active. So there's so much interest, moral attachment to emotional attachment to this tool that you cannot tell anybody to truncate it. It's a waste of time if anybody tries. So Jeff, when you say chiefs are willing to help when giving that opportunity, are you suggesting that currently you're not being, being given enough opportunity to help? Yes, yes. We are, we are not there. There's no consultation. You have a DCE who may live here and decide that because his boss is in Accra, may not even return your call. You may have people who are just doing whatever they want because they believe in the DCE and the regional minister more than they believe in their local uh, chief. So we are not assigned to do things that will enhance policy, that will bring development. Incidentally, we do it on our own. And we want government to support us in that bit. Have you spoken to government about this, previous government, current government? Oh, yes, yes. The suggestions I made have been made to them. 
I have gone on to say that we need to elect our DCs, and I'm glad that Nanado and his government is going to do that on the 18th. That DCs must be elected. The argument on the other side is the president will lose his reps in those uh, districts. It's far from it. The people must know who is representing them and their interests. That's one. If you call a DCE and he knows that a guy is posed or he's elected by the people, he will then will listen to the king or the chief. Because then he knows that uh, the people is representative locally as exactly. the king or the chief. Exactly. And so that's what's happening. I know these little things must be done. It's done everywhere. No one, centrality of governance is outdated, Winston. It's outdated. Nowhere do you do that anymore. Because when you decentralize, this is what you do. Systems are small. You can manage it better. There's transparency. There's accountability. And you give the people the dignity of voice to take charge of their destiny and to shape their own future. But what are the National House of Chiefs doing about all of this? We are beginning. Today we have a, a dynamic young leader in uh, Tobafid, well-educated. Uh, he believes in development. He believes in negotiations. So we are talking to government high levels to say that we can play a major role in bringing development to our people. Should chiefs participate in active partisan politics? I don't know what that is. Give me an explanation. Define that a little further. The Constitution says chiefs should not be involved in active partisan politics. And each, and any chief seeking to do so should abdicate his stool or skin. That, that is unfair. I have, I have a problem with that. Hmm, tell us. Because I didn't get this by government. Government is not paying me. This is a family business. The people of Achim elected to do this. I'm not drawing any insurance or health care from central government. And if the job is in Accra and I want to apply, why should I give up my family stool? Unfair. Secondly, the active policy that you're talking about, Winston, if a party is campaigning and in their manifesto, they write, we are going to engage and encourage gay marriages. I sit here and a party has that in the manifesto. Or better yet, a party says that we will continue to give uh, uh, small scale miners license to mine. You want to tell me because the constitution says that I cannot engage in active policy. I will tell my fellow, my, my people, don't vote for this party. Because it's a disaster to have gay marriages. But in their constitution, they wanted to shut up, not say anything publicly. I can't call people privately and tell them that this is what they're going to do, so vote against them. I need to hold a dabber. It depends. I mean, it's, 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 I don't understand. The ones about the civil servants, I do understand. They draw their paycheck from central government. So you cannot hold central government pay, pay job and take a pay and still try to apply for another job. We are not there. I buy my own petrol. I don't ask government to give me anything. So if I decide, or any of my chiefs decide that, well, I think I'll be better serve my people if I become an MP. You are saying he can't, but he has to give up what his family's uh, uh, property. I think that's unfair, but it's the Constitution. Until we change that, we'll see. Because for, for, for those who defend it, they say the chieftain's institution is a very sacred one, if I could put it, a very respectable institution. And so based on, you know, you're representing the whole people. Now, if you decide to contest as a member of parliament, you're doing so one on the ticket of a political party. Yeah. Meanwhile, you represent everybody now. And so the sort of acrimony and everything, maybe the chieftain's institution should be spared of all of that. Let's, let's make it a, a personal decision. Let's make it a personal decision. But this sacredness and reverence is not working. We're not treated as such. We are not treated sacredly and with reverence. We are not treated as such. You have young people who insult chiefs in the open. Where is the sacredness? And you have political party people who try to uh, encourage and support that type of line. So where is it? So that was just something just to, as we say, to butter us up, to maybe shut up. We know we're sacred. Those who treat us such, no, but not in the political arena. Only see them 
when there's elections. The combine and uh, you are the father of all this area, and we have come to you. We cannot step on the land without coming to say greetings. And by the time election is over, you'll be here all by yourself. Mm. So it is in the Constitution. I wasn't here, and a lot of my colleagues who were guests were not here. If it should come in the open again, there will be a high debate. It must be a personal decision, not an institutional decision. You cannot discriminate against chiefs who otherwise want to be politicians. We have lawyers who are being politicians. We have accountants who go to politics. So how can chiefs could not, how come they can't be uh, uh, MPs? That should be left to them to decide. Them to decide. All right, so my guest this afternoon on Hot Issues is Osaji Fuamwetu for opinion or chaining. And we're talking about issues of national interest. We're talking about issues of, you know, the role of the chief tenancy institution in the development of this country. We go for a short break. When we return after this break, we'll find out more from Osaji Fuamwetu for opinion. Stay with us. We'll be right back. All right, so welcome back from that short break, and thanks for staying with us. This is Hot Issues with me, Winston Amwa, and today our guest is Ochehini Osaji from Waitio for a Pinning. We're at the Palace of the Ochehini, and we're having a very good discussion in the interest of Mother Ghana. So, Osaji, we've been talking about allowing chiefs to make that decision. Would you make that decision also? Have you considered it? Oh, no, Winston. I, I like where I'm at. I like uh, to be here. Uh, it's a job that I, I picked up. I never, as a kid, uh, planned to be here. But once I got here, uh, I'd like to uh, use this office to help our people. And I can do that without being an MP or getting into active politics. But again, uh, let's make that a decision that individual chiefs will make. Because it's a job. Okay. They can have two jobs. And you can't deny them going to parliament because of sacredness and, and uh, reverence. And some of them are riding trotro. Mm. Oh, yes. Some of the chiefs. Some of the chiefs don't have cars. So you deny a man a job is very discriminatory. And laws that are unjust in constitution are just unjust and needs to be addressed. Yes, because in the Constitution doesn't make it right. We need to obey and live within the bounds of the Constitution. But if need be, that has to change, in my view. Okay. How does it feel knowing that the President of the Republic is, uh, you know, from the Eastern region, from, uh, you know, your land, and also a royal? Well, Western, um, you know, we, we have been involved in this thing. By we, I mean my family and the people of our chimp generally have been involved in this politics for quite a while. And then when every time you talk about the big six, three of them are from here. And three of them are blood related. The fourth one, Akwa J, a good friend of JB, also lived here in a J. Chrome in our chimp all his life. And so it was quite strange that no precedent had come from this area. But we waited on the Lord. And the president was patient. And the day that he was pronounced president, we said the work of J.B. and William and Akufuad, his father, and all those people who believed in democracy. This town was once referred to by President Kufu as the mecca of Ghana's politics. So with that pedigree and with that intellectual furniture that have been displayed over the years, this president has earned his right to be in the flash half hours. When you say it was something that was waited for, I, I, I just would want to understand, and I guess many of our viewers would want to understand. So when finally it came to pass, what was the sort of mood within Wanda Palace and to uh, the, uh, you know, Achim area. When he lost in 2008 and then 2012 through the court, his worry was 
He doesn't want to go down history as the man who took the MPP out of power. Remember Kufors in power? Yeah. And he came on and they lost. And it was eating them up. At the time when people were advising him, and I think this is the last one, don't do it again, he said, I gotta get it back. At least for posterity. That my name will not be the one saying that I came and I took the MPP out of power. So it was a welcoming feeling. It was very emotional. And uh, not only that, he's not there just because, I, as I say, he was blood relative of J.B. and Powell and his father. He's there because I think he can do the job. And we're looking forward for the visible change that Ghanaians are looking for. So by the end of his term, whether he does one or two, we'll be able to display the legacy of his achievement. What's it about the president that makes you feel that he can do the job? He's selfless. He is talking about poverty all the time. He's very generous. And he's not corrupt. In the affairs of the family, you cannot do anything without an adult if it's wrong without him telling you. So I believe that he can assemble a good team. Of course, he can't do it by himself. One of the greatest assets of leadership is to be able to delegate authority and have great people around you for the pursuit of the goal. If there is one thing that you would want him to be remembered for, what would that be? That in his time, poverty was never a bar to learning. That every child born in this land will have a chance to go to school, to enrich their mind and to enhance their God-given talent. Because you understand education is the key. And so what I want the people to remember him by is that every child will have a desk to write on, a chair to sit on, and a good teacher to learn from. Mm -hmm. That's what another's legacy for me would be. Okay, so let's get to illegal mining, Galamse now and you've been at the forefront of it. But let's look at the fight previously. What's your assessment of our previous rule, I mean, our previous effort in curbing this menace? Winston, I, on this one, I will allow me to blow my little trumpet sure. a little bit. Everybody knows how I have fought for conservation and reservation and preservation. I didn't go to school to study environmental science, but I love nature. And I believe that as we try to defend the rule of law, the biggest rule for humanity is the rule of nature. So my involvement in the environment was just that. And we fought chainsaw operators. We had billboards all around Achimam reminding people about decency and how we should appreciate nature. Prince Charles had invited 200 top environmentalists in the world. I was the only traditional leader. Okay. I have gone to places and given lectures, share a stage with Martin Mandela and Quinno in Durban, South Africa. I have given lectures to World Banks. I've gone to talk to members of the common, uh, House of Commons. I've done my bit. And around 209, the avalanche of people came into our towns. It is not our fault that this area is rich in gold. So we started talking about it. There's not a minister, a member of Chamber of Mines, Mineral Commission, Forestry Commission, presidents, MPs, that I haven't talked to about this menace. It's destructive, it's disgraceful, it's disrespectful to nature. One day I went, when it started, I went to President Mills and told him, Mr. Mill, President, there's something happening in our area that you need to help me. He called Ufusu Ampo for the then regional minister, and he was angry, 
I was angry, and President Mills told him, you need to put a team together to stop this right now. Yeah. Truth to his word, uh, Honorable Fusu Ampofu puts a team together and came here, of course clandestinely, and confiscated maybe about 16, 17 excavators. And um, it went down a little bit. A week later, all the excavators were released back to the owners. And he told me that he's amazed the power behind those excavators. We didn't stop there. We went out to chase these guys, confiscate it. We couldn't confiscate excavators because we had no way to do that, no transport. And it got to a point where these foreigners who probably didn't know or didn't know who I was, started throwing stones at my car. Really? Uh, you don't know that, and some of them were shooting. Hmm. So the traditional council came and warned me and I should stop. We called the police almost every day about this. And it was still going on. But when, Two, when were shooting at your car, and did you inform the police about it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. What happened? These are boys with no names and no addresses. They'll go there and they'll run, and the next day they'll come. So we have done all we can. I got tired until somewhere in 2013, some family member with his own motives decided to put my name out there. And he took off, and everybody said, oh, wow, you're here. People were saying that the palace is being dug. Go around, we're here. But the pain for me is those who know me and know what I stand for should not believe one bit. I am the Alodia title on of our Chim Lines, Winston. If I wanted to do mining, I would take my land. I don't need to ask anybody and go to Mineral Commission and secure proper license to do proper mining. Why would I turn around and and steal my land to engage in such debt that I'm saying. I mean, you, you think about it. I don't like mining as it is, if you know my history. The large scale mine I, I always speak against. Because Takwa, Prestia, Bogosu, Akwetia, Obuasi, what have we got to show? I went to Johannesburg and I came back and I told President Kufo, Mr. President. Something struck me in Johannesburg. I read the history. They built that city because of gold. What happened to us? So that has been my position all along. If I ever wanted to be rich, it won't be going into mining, let alone Galamse. And the question comes again, how come his boys are doing it? They will tell you. I sacked several of them. I destroyed the chief of Chebi. The boys, after a while, said, no. Now, now, you say we should stop. We have stopped, but foreigners are coming to take our gold. And you are not stopping them. So what do we do? Immediately, I called the police from uh, Eastern Region. I said, look, this is getting beyond me now. Chinese have the audacity to put machines on the Birim River and take gold. And they are armed. They have weapons. I say, say, how come if you tell your people, how come they are not paying heed? You understand this postmodern culture of young people not respecting authority and discipline. Discipline has broken down. They do it daytime. You chase them out. They come nighttime and do it. And it's not my fault again that these parts have so much gold. The key to this whole gun I'm saying is government has to stop it. The president is the trustee of our gold. The constitution says that. And Galam say is not something, Winston, that people hide. Okay. They're in the open. The excavators are there. 
It's hard to catch a wife beater, an internet froster, or even somebody selling cocaine. So how come we see it and we let it go? Law enforcement is the key. And I think this time, talking to the minister, I think this time they're serious. We'd come to, we'd come to this time, but what's the challenge, with, particularly with chiefs, in dealing with this problem? For instance, I have 1,300, 1,000 villages under me. As state councils, you can pull the records. I warn them every day. How am I supposed to supervise at the crack of dawn some chief negotiating with a minor who had brought the chief a paper from Mineral Commission? Fake it could be, as they are going to mine. And they show them maybe 20,000 CDs. This chief probably hasn't seen 20,000 CDs in 10 years. So maybe they will agree that go and dig. My point is, if the chief even allows a land to be mined, that chief has no right, and that chief must also be prosecuted and arrested, because he has no right to give land for, land, uh, for, for mining. And they will swear that they don't do it, but who knows? I'm saying to you, if you catch an arm robber, you take his gun. If you see a Galam say, take his excavator, you disarm them. But that's what they do the damage with. And government is not doing that. And you call just last October. The reason I came back to this, the CDS became a friend of mine. Okay. And I said to him, I said, I want you to help me. He said, well, I said, well, I need you to bring soldiers to see if the last time you can stop this Galam say. He called Kofi, your guy, and other people. The one area, get spots. Brought 350 soldiers into this town areas. By four days, this whole thing was shut down. They had confiscated excavators. Everybody was running, including Chinese. Fifth, sixth day, they were asked to go to Accra. Why? Orders from above. We ask, who, if the CDS has ordered something, who is above the CDS? Hmm. And sometimes, political parties are, are more powerful than the president. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. They said, don't you know it's an election year? This is not official. This is what some of the soldiers said. Don't you know it's an election year? So we value votes more than voters values just last October and he showed me that if we're serious to stop this it could be stopped 300 soldiers were able to clean up this thing for four days all of them will tell you and then we are here now do you get the perception I mean the impression that uh, the politicians our leaders are not really in the past have not been committed towards fighting this I've said it if, if, if you are selling drugs, Winston, and you're caught, you're caught. Unless you don't take Kalamsi as a criminal activity. If you see it as a criminal activity, then of course law enforcement should arrest it. I think we've not been serious. Since we are not have, I don't have a coercive force, since I don't have weapons, I think the only way that we can deal with this is law enforcement handling this once and for all. But those who were arrested at the time, they were, they were taken to court, weren't they? And what happened? That's the point. So What happened? When it gets to law enforcement and they are taken to court and released. My point is, they have weapons. Their key tool to do the damage is the excavator. Confiscate that. Confiscate the excavator and other tools. They may want to go buy another one. Do the same thing. You know, these boys who work don't own the excavators, mind you. They can't afford it. It is some big boy who is sponsoring it. So take the excavator. When you have drugs in your car and the narcotics people see you, that car is confiscated, isn't it? Yeah. So why not, what I'm saying? 
we'll go for a final break. Now, when we return after this break, we'll find out from you, uh, you know, going forward. Now, there's a new fight. We'll find out your, you know, impressions about this fight. You say we should enforce the law, but beyond the enforcement, we'll also find out what we can do. There's a talk of, you know, banning small-scale mining totally. We'll get Osage Fuamuichi for opinions, thought on this particular one, as well as uh, the large-scale mining also. This is Hot Issues, and today we are with Ochehini Osage Fuamuichi for opinions. I'm Winston Amwa. We go for our final break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. All right, so welcome back from that short break, and thanks for staying with us. This is a special edition of Hot Issues with Ochehini Osajefu Amwetia Ufuripining. We're talking about issues of national development and, of course, how we can win the fight against Kalamse. Osajefu, so what do you make of the new resolve in fighting this menace? I love it, Winston. I love it because uh, TV3, CTFM, PCFM, Every day you're bombarding the public with this stop galamse. And I think it's going on well. The public is outraged about this destruction. And it has been our prayer that one day we'll come to this. Mm. To, to have people see what it is and stop it. Yes, but talking about it is one thing. You've been talking about it always. What else should we do differently? Yes, we're talking, but what must we do differently? Exactly what at first you need to stop it. These guys will not stop and think we put coercive force to dismantle the oppression. And then we will think what we're going to do with the damaged land and the water bodies that have been polluted. We have to stop them at their tracks. We have to stop them. Because it has happened before. If you don't sustain it, they are going to come back. Their question, as you hear people say, and I think it's really, really nonsense, excuse me, that what should they do if they don't do Galamse? What were they doing before? We need to create jobs in this country. We need to find alternative livelihoods for these guys. We need to make sure that we can plant trees and do something, educate our people. Part of the responsibility of government is to create jobs so you can kill poverty. This thing is economic rate driven and poverty driven. So we need to stop it first. We cannot have a position where, well, let them do it until we find something for them. In the meantime, short gain profits and destroy the future of our children. There are those who've also added, now that it has been established that small scale licenses do not have parliamentary approval, they say that should also be banned. You support that? I support that. You heard me on the way. I support that because that's a conduit. They come with a small scale, all right? And then, you see that small scale mining giving spots for galamseas and collecting money. So they come in legally, and before you know, the whole place is a mess. You know, but Winston, how long are we going to mine? They have stopped mining in Johannesburg, they have transformed the city, they are creating jobs. How long are we going to mine? Are we going to leave some of this deposit underneath the land for our future generation? Maybe when they come up, they'll have the technical know-how and the money and the capital to mine and do it differently. Why should we mine everything that we see in our time? That doesn't speak well of us. We are not generational thinking leaders then because we want it now and forget about future. future. What come? How come our children will come up in this country and have a country with nothing? We need to manage it properly. We have mined this country. Obuasi, it got to a point where Ghanam said had the audacity to enter Obuasi, an international agreement, Anglo Gold in Ghana, and do Ghanam say there. In the process, a young man lost his life. Was that also a chief's problem? Obuasi. Kalam says disrupted the oppression and took over the mines. Right here in the Sikkim, they have stopped surface mining. Now they are going underground. We've called the police. Of course, the police have stopped it. But these guys don't care. They want their money now. Whatever happens to anybody. So we need no, I mean, if we have no guns. We have no weapons to chase them. And I don't want a confrontation where people will die. So take the excavators and their tools. 
If they bring 100, take the 100. If we do that, it will hurt their pocket and they will stop. When you say we should leave, you know, uh, mining for maybe the future generation to decide, are you suggesting we stop large-scale mining also? Because for me, it was to, we don't own our resources. If we're doing it and we're the owners, and people are becoming millionaires in this country as a result, I don't mind. This mineral laws and mineral codes about 1910. What's that in today's world? If our country does not own our country. We don't own our resources. If you want to know why we are poor, because the money that are made in this country does not stay here. That's why I'm first, I'm against large scale mining. They take all the monies and they go. I see we don't deserve anything. There are young people here in this country who ought to become millionaires, who ought to own capital. We've had cocoa since uh, Fernando Poe. There's no one cocoa farmer who's a millionaire. Check that out. Why don't we want to empower our own people? We're quick to sign contracts with foreigners. I'm not saying we're not going to be part of this foreign direct investment thing that's going on, but we cannot always give our resources all. We don't own anything, Winston. If this guy decides to pull out, our domestic economy will hurt. That's why we're always begging. That's why we're always begging. We go and beg a man to help our elections and our educational budget. You can't beg him and fight him at the same time. You cannot beg a man and fight him at the same time. We need to build this country where we are strong on our legs, we can bargain with power and enrich our people. There are young millionaires in Nigeria and elsewhere. We don't have any here. Well, if they do, they're hiding. But the point I'm making is you cannot always negotiate your contract and have somebody have 90%, you get 10. Look at Aquatia. So my point is, if we are mining and it's not benefiting us directly or hugely, then we need to put a hold on it and see what. There are several ways that we can make money in this country. There's service industry. There's plantation, cocoa farms. There's uh, IT, Bangalore, in India, has made an industry out of uh, data entry and call calling. Why not here? And the Ghanaian speaks better English than people in India. Mm -hmm. When I call up my American Express, some Indian is talking to me with an accent. Young people in this country can do that. Why don't we look at other areas? You know? And if we think we're going to mine everything, everything that we see we're going to mine, uh, it's not good for our future generations and what they're going to do when they come up. How difficult is it dealing with uh, you know, the Chinese illegal miners? Uh, now that, you know, like you make the point, uh, we go to them sometimes for help, and they've told us we need to be careful how we go about it. What's the difficulty we face now? Well, how did they get here in the first place? How did they get here? How does this guy stop at Kutuka and find their way in some little village that I don't even know? How? Breakdown of law enforcement, the immigration, and everything. We need to have a country that we're serious about. People enter your country, and you don't even know where they are. And the reason that is, again, to another point, when we decided, Kufos and we decided to do a national identification card, 10 years down the road, we haven't finished. Why is that? Identification cards would have wiped up some of these things because you would be able to identify people and the addresses. And when people don't have the address, you call them, what are you doing here? Last year before the election, a, a car load of Nigerians came into Chebi. Mm. Oh, yes, a truck full of Nigerians came to Chebi. We called the, uh, uh, the DCE, we called the police, said, how do you know they are Nigerians? They can't speak a word of English. We knew they were foreigners. And they did nothing about it. Nothing about it. They will tell you during the elections. Was that also, I guess that was also my fault, allowing Niger to come here. I mean, we've grown past that. You talk about 60 years. Yeah. 60 years, Winston, we've not been able to build a superhighway between Accra and Kumasi. 
60 years, no railway system. What this will do, according to my friend, the South Korean ambassador who just left town, he said, we started off by education and infrastructure. What infrastructure does, Winston, is it connects disadvantaged people and their communities to economic opportunity. You can't drive from here uh, to, to, to Kumasi. And then when you drive from Accra to Cape Coast, we have no foresight that no one is building single lane highways anymore. Mm. But we are doing it. And we're having headlong collisions. And people are dying every day. Every day, we're, car accidents is like plane crash in Ghana. Where is it? Who makes the rule? Who makes the rules? Why are we building single lane highways and putting gutters in, the, in 21st century, 2017? And yet we go overseas, we see what they've done there, don't we learn? I don't make the decisions. But I'm saying if, if your number one city and number two city is not connected by dual highway, there's something wrong with leadership. There's something wrong. We had a railway system in Ghana. What happened to it? And the violation of the principle of priorities. We haven't fixed our road and we're building airports. We have not finished fixing our roads. The Americans built their highways and their railway system before the Wright brothers came and built airplanes. We are building airplanes in Tamale and Ho. And we are paying 29 million to build a runway in Kumasi. And then right there in Okonfuanochi, they're having babies who are dying. Dying at birth. There's no money. In Kolebu, pregnant women can't get beds to sleep on. When you get sick with kidneys, you, you die in this country. A complete violation of the principal priorities. We need to build roads and highways before we start thinking about airports. Mm -hmm. And Sajid, for finally, do you envisage us succeeding in this fight against Galamsey, based on what the media and everybody started? I, I am optimistic for two reasons, not three. You guys, the minister, and then we have a new sheriff in town. Who's that? The president. He's committed. So I think we'll get there. And we have to sustain it and then take those lands and resuscitate the land, reclaim the land. We have a program called Plant Your Future. We want to plant economic trees. We want to plant cassava. We want to plant bamboo along the Burem rivers. These are jobs that we want to engage and employ those guys who use the uh, Kalamse as their daily uh, bread and see where we go. But it has to be sustained. Otherwise, 2020 rolls around. And I bet you, call me if it's true, we're going to have a new campaign message called Vote for Me, I'll Bring Kalamse Back. Really? Yes, you watch. Asadio Fuamwe Tio for opinion. We're very grateful to you. But finally, before we go, anything you want to say as your closing statement? We have a great nation. We have a great nation. But we have to own our country. We have to give young entrepreneurs, young, smart, brilliant young people in this country a chance. We have to let them award some of these contracts to them and see. They can do it. Even the last came on, why don't you give it to a Ghanaian and have them employ somebody from outside if the problem is capital? We need to rise, Winston, above our individual concerns and embrace the concerns of our communities and our nation. If we do that, future generations will build Statues and monuments in our name. Sajafu, I'm with you for your opinion. Thank you very much for joining us. All right, so folks.
That's all from us this afternoon on a special edition of Hot Issues on TV3 with me, Winston Amoy. You heard from Osaje Fuamwetio for a painting on speaking to us on issues of national interest as well as on our fight against Kalamsi. Thank you so much for being a part of us on behalf of the team. There's a large team this afternoon because we had to bring it from the Ochehine's Palace. We're grateful to all of you for watching. Keep watching TV3. We're out. Bye.